<clears throat> we want to say greetings to everyone and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Brother Hawk Bolden and of course we're going to uh, continue with our discussion. We're glad to have you join us today and uh, we're going to continue with our discussion that, that uh, we've been talking about. Uh, how to be sure of your salvation. Of course this stems from a email that we received earlier uh, maybe a week and a half ago from a brother and uh, we're gonna read it so that you can kinda get the gist of where we're coming from uh, when we're addressing this. It says Brother Bolden and family I recently asked a family member whether or not they were saved expecting to hear them say yes because they were baptized when they were 12, grew up in the church, and they have also spoken in tongues. But to my surprise, they told me that they didn't know. To be honest with you, that hurt me because they seemed so unsure of their salvation. How and can I minister to them to bring assurance of their salvation through Jesus Christ? I have been praying for them, but I honestly don't know what else I can do for them. I also assume there are other Christians who are doubting their salvation. Could you please shed some light on this matter? I love this person and I see how their uncertainty is affecting their walk with the Lord. All right. So uh, th this person who emailed us has a relative that they uh, asked if they were saved and the person responded with they didn't know if they were saved. And of course we know uh, apparently they uh, were in church, uh, they were baptized when they were 12, and they spoke in tongues as well. And of course we've already covered that none of those things solidify our salvation in Christ. Uh, going to church, uh, again the devil goes to church. Uh, being baptized when you're 12, a lot of times people get baptized um, just to be able to join church. You know, that's part of joining church. And so you can join an organization, uh, not saying anything bad about any organization, but you can join an organization, but the true church of God, you cannot join it. You're born into it, you see. You're born in it. Then the speaking in tongues, the Bible makes it clear that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Uh, that means that uh, you don't have to be saved to operate in the gifts of God. You see, that is not through our holiness that the gifts of God operate. And that we have to make that clear. We have to make that very clear. And so it doesn't matter what kind of gift you have. You can prophesy. You can raise the dead. You can do all of these things and still not be saved. You see that? And so how, if, if we can't go off of, if we can't base our salvation on how long we've been going to church or whether we're going to church, uh, what age we were when we were baptized or whether or not we were baptized. If we can't base our salvation on the gifts of God, then what can we base our salvation on? First of all, we have to know how salvation comes, you see. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. God wants you to know how this takes place, how salvation comes. He wants you to understand that you can be sure of your salvation. I don't believe that God wants anyone to live their life unsure of what kind of relationship they have with him, if they have any at all. You see that? God wants you to be sure of your salvation. He wants you to be sure. Now, again, we have to keep stressing this. Let's not be halfway in and halfway out. Let's dedicate our whole lives to him. Let's live for the Lord with our whole heart. And, and and not be, you know, um, um, on the fence, so to speak. You know, let's, let's be completely sold out to the Lord. But even, even in that, now let me make this clear. When we're talking about salvation, we're not talking about having a zeal for God. That's, that's completely different. Now that's one thing that you have to know. People can have a zeal for God, and if you, if, if, you, you, you can read that in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, how people have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You see, so 
People can have a zeal for God, can have a real zeal for God. You, you, and, and I imagine there are some people uh, that base their salvation and whether or not they're saved on the fact of their zeal, on the, on the uh, preface, preface of their zeal. In other words, I'm doing this for God. I'm writing books. I'm preaching all over the world. I'm reaching thousands or millions of people. I'm doing all of this, so surely I must be saved. And even that, your salvation is not based off of, you see. Your, your salvation isn't based off of your zeal for God. You can have a zeal for God, but zeal is not enough. You see that? Zeal is supposed to be a fruit of salvation, not, not evidence of salvation is supposed to be a fruit of it. In other words, just because you have a zeal does not mean that you're saved. And I'm going to tell you what I've noticed over the years. I've come across people that have a zeal for God and in their zeal they want to acquire knowledge and and before you know it that zeal for God turns into a zeal for knowledge. And so and then that zeal for knowledge just like in the Garden of Eden it leads people away from God because just because you are in the library or you know on online Google and everything it does not mean that you have a zeal for God you could just have a zeal for knowledge and and it and and some of that knowledge might not be true which is what leads people away from God and and uh, and that's exactly where we get these so-called uh, of course black Hebrew Israelites people you know they at one time had a zeal for God and then that zeal for God turned into a zeal for knowledge and then that zeal for knowledge if you if when you're not careful and you don't understand that it has gone from a zeal for God to a zeal for knowledge then the devil will bring in some knowledge and you have no idea that he's the one that's leading you and so people were walking around or walking around um, calling God by his ancient name and of course there's nothing wrong with calling him Yah or Yeshua you know speaking in the native Hebrew tongue but God understands who you're talking to when you're talking to him so whether you're saying Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever the case may be because sometimes I refer to him as that but I have a relationship with him and so I could call him God and he'll know exactly who I'm talking about you see that and so sometimes that zeal for God turns into zeal for knowledge and when it does that that's when the devil will sneak in some doctrine he'll give you more knowledge if that's what you're in love with the only problem is it'll be full of lies and and those lies will lead you away from God you see that and I'm telling you where does the black Hebrew Israelite go they they come against that name Jesus Christ ultimately they can't stand the name Jesus is which is why they try to call him some Hebrew version of the name you see that or some Aramaic version of the name of Jesus you see but I believe God created all languages and so no matter what language you say his name in he understand you don't have to and then who says that the Hebrew tongue was the original tongue nobody can say what was the original tongue of man at the Tower of Babel when God sent the angel to split up the language, it doesn't say what the original language was. And so just because you know his language, you know the Hebrew tongue, that don't mean that you got a, a, a special doorway to God. You see that? And so that's something that the Lord wants us to share. People have a zeal. And it could be the wrong zeal. You see that? In other words, it could be in the wrong category. Keep your zeal for God. And even having a zeal for God doesn't mean that you are righteous or doesn't mean that you're saved. The Pharisees, they had a zeal for God. But according to the word of God, it wasn't according to knowledge. It wasn't according to the truth, in other words. And that's what God wants us to understand. So you can't base your salvation off of having a zeal for God. Or even how busy you are for God. You can write 30 Christian books. And it could be the bestseller according to the New York Times bestselling list. That don't make you saved. It, it, and it's the same thing as people, you know, <clears throat> you can ask 
a woman, <clears throat> whether or not her husband love her. And she'll say, yeah, my husband loved me. And you may ask her, how? How do you know your husband love you? Oh, because he buys me nice things, and he bought me a car, and he pays my bills, and I don't have a care in this world. But you know, people take care of dogs, too. Dogs don't pay bills. They don't go out grocery shopping. So you see what I mean? You can be going down the wrong path because you're basing something off of something that really shouldn't be there. That, that you shouldn't be basing it off of. How, do, how can you tell, you ladies, how can you tell that your husband love you? Or how can you tell if a man love you? First of all, he has to have a relationship with love himself. That's talking about with God. The Bible says that God is love. And a man can't love you if he don't have love in his life. In other words, God in his life. So you see, when you, and so many people, they carry that over into their relationship with God. They base their relationship with God off of the wrong things. And a lot of times it's based off of their own carnality. In other words, if I love somebody, I'll buy them things. And it's really because that's what I like. I like to buy things. And so when I see somebody, if they're not buying me things, they don't love me in my mind. See, that's carnal. And so what happens is people bring that carnality over into their Christian walk. And they begin to think, well, God loves me because he takes care of me. The Bible says that God takes care of the birds, the fowls of the air. But you know what? They don't know what it is to be saved. And we'll never know what it is to be saved. So you can't base, you see, salvation off of what God does for you. The Bible says he maketh his son to, to rise on the just as well as the unjust. You see that? So just because the uh, p people that saved, you're not the only ones that see in the sun. Unsaved people see it as well. People that's, that's unsaved, you're not the only one that it rains on. It rains on those that are saved as well. So you can't base it off of those outward things. So what can you base it off of? Let's read the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So he's telling you, that word quickened means to make alive. It says, And you have he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So let's make this clear. When you're living in sin, you're dead. And Jesus Christ come to make you alive by pulling you out of sin and trespasses. Let's go ahead and keep reading verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. In other words, you did things the way that this world did them. Let's keep reading. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You see that? Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation, in other words, our manner of life, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You see what that's saying? You can fulfill the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So, that also means, you see, that not only can you act out sin in your flesh, but in your mind, you can sin. Just by thinking a certain way, you can sin. Now, we're not talking about the devil introducing thoughts. We're talking about your mindset being the way that it is. That can be a sin. Let's go ahead and keep reading. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You know, there's a scripture in the book of Psalms. That says that God is angry at sinners every day. And that's for folks that's got a problem with, you know, a just and righteous God. You know, sinners out in the world, they, they, they'll say, well, I don't believe you, could, you should preach about an angry God. You know, God is love. You know what God loves? Holiness. And God would be unjust not to judge righteously. 
There is a difference between the holy and profane with him. If you're living in sin, you're not accepted by God. And we have to make that clear. If you're living in sin, you are not accepted by God. You see that? Let's go ahead and keep reading. It says, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So it's talking about those people that are saved now, that we were at one time the children of wrath. In other words, God's wrath abiding on us. God's wrath abiding on us. That means when we made decisions God's, uh, uh, that was contrary to, the, to God's will for our, for our lives, his wrath was right there. His wrath was. It wasn't just happenstance. It wasn't just, well, bad things happen to good people. No. Also, bad things happen to folks that are disobedient. And you need to be able to tell the difference. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. So, let's read that again. Even when we were dead in sins. You see that? So, notice that word were, that's past tense. It says, you were dead in sins. Look at what that says there. Hath quickened us together with Christ. Has made us alive with Christ, in other words. By grace ye are saved. Now, a lot of times, the reason why people don't know whether or not they're saved is because they have not accepted the grace of God. Again, many times in this world, as parents and as adults, we teach our children and other adults that to get anything in this life, you have to earn it. You have to work for it. And I, I, believe, I don't believe that that's a bad thing to teach children. But you know what? While you're teaching them how the world operates, you also need to teach them how God operates. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 6, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Verse 8, For by grace are you saved. How? Through faith. So you know what that means? That means that after mom and daddy have taught you to work for everything that you obtain in this life. That your mind need to be renewed. So that you can accept the greatest gift of all. Without having to work for it. This says for by grace are you saved through faith. That means that you have to believe. That it is a gift. That it is an unmerited favor. If you knocked on somebody's door, you may have bought them a brand new house or a brand new car. And you can knock on someone's door and say, hey, here are the keys to your brand new house, to your brand new car. They will go into shock. Why? Because it goes against what they've been taught by nature. The nature of sowing and reaping. I sow my time and my work into my job. And I reap a paycheck every other Friday or every Friday or whatever. And so when you give somebody something that's of great value without any strings attached, they have a hard time accepting it. That's hard to believe. And that's where people are. That's the reason why people question their salvation. That's what makes people uh, get on this roller coaster of not of trying to figure out whether or not they're really saved. That's what makes people think I'm saved today and tomorrow I'm not saved. And that, of course, also contributes to the idea of people acting saved. In other words, today I'm saved, so I'm not going to do this. And then tomorrow I'm not sure, so it's just, you know, anything goes. You see that? Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, 
And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And I'm telling you, you God has that gift for everybody that's breathing. For everybody that's breathing in this world, that gift is yours for free. But you know what you have to do to exchange and receive that gift? Not work for it, not money, not cars, not time. What does it take? What is the currency to receive that gift of God? That currency is your faith. That exchange is your faith. That's all. It doesn't matter. Listen, it doesn't matter what you've done yesterday. It doesn't matter what you've done this morning. You could have fornicated this morning. If you will repent, <clears throat> God will receive you. If you will repent and, and dedicate your life to God, he will receive you today. doesn't matter what you've done this morning. Repent and God will receive you. It's really that simple. You don't have to get ready. You see that? Think about it. When you get sick and you get sick enough to go to the hospital or you get sick enough to want to take medicine or to need medicine, you don't say in your heart, well, you know, I haven't been sick long enough. I'm going to give myself some time. You know, I'm going to punish myself by being sick for five days and then I'll know I'm sick enough. In other words, you don't prepare yourself to get well by being sick for any length of time. And that's the same case with salvation. You don't have to punish yourself in sin, like waddle in it, be off in a corner somewhere, Telling God how sorry you are for five days before you feel good enough to come before him. Salvation is a gift. It's not anything you deserve anyway. And if it was something that we all merited, nobody would be saved. Now that's the truth. And so God wants you to know that. Salvation is free. And so you may say, well, Brother Bolden, it seems like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. One, one minute ago, you said that there's a currency for salvation. That's faith. Well, listen, l let me ask you something. How much did you pay for that faith? How much, did you, how much do you have to pay to believe in something? Nothing. The Bible makes it clear. God has given us all a measure of faith. And when you are born and you come to your senses, you already have enough faith to be saved. But the question is, are you going to exchange it for salvation? Because listen, you're going to always put faith in something. Always. Faith is always there. The question is, what are you putting faith in? Are you putting it in your works? Whether or not you were good enough today? Are you putting it in your vehicle? And most of us have faith in our vehicles. We get in our car, we expect it to get us to, from point A to point B. Most of us even have faith in other people. So why not extend that same faith to God and say, God, you're all powerful. I know that your grace and your mercy, there's enough of it to go around for me, and I accept your salvation by faith. It's not anything that I have to see. I just believe it. And you may say, well, Brother Bolin, is it really that simple? Yes, it is. You can start off today Believing in God for your salvation. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 9, it says, Not of works, lest any should, man should boast. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see that? So this is saying we are God's workmanship. That means that whenever works are produced in us, it's because God is operating through us. That means I don't have to go out of my way if I have a backbiting tongue. I don't have to go out of my way and paste scriptures all over the house to remind me, you know, not to backbite. If God is living on the inside of me, he's going to produce the type of fruit that I'm supposed to produce. So we don't need to ask God, God, please stop my tongue from backbiting. 
What we really need to do is say, God, I need more love on the inside of me so that I won't backbite. Get to the root of it. Because listen, even though God can come and hush your mouth, even at, you know, at the extreme of making you a dumb person, in other words, a person that's not able to speak, that don't mean that that backbiting spirit have left. It could still be in your heart. You don't have to, it don't have to come out of your mouth for it to be sin. Just think it in your heart and your mind. You see that? And so what is it? Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. This Bible makes it clear, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. In other words, a new creation. We are created to bring forth good works. And that's what salvation is. Salvation isn't, Lord, when I get good enough, then I'll come to you, because you'll never be good enough. Salvation is, Lord, I accept your gift by faith, and I'm looking forward to producing the fruit, because you are living on the inside of me. Amen. We want to say thank you all for joining us today, and we pray that something was said that have been a blessing to you, and we pray that you will continue to listen in to this broadcast. Have a blessed day.